This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Designing Reality – How to Survive and Thrive in the Third Digital Revolution by the Gershenfeld Brothers in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or visit my website for downloads. Chapter 1 – How to Make Almost Anything The first digital revolution was in communication. Before that, analog telephone calls degraded with distance. We now have a globe-spanning internet that makes it as easy to talk someone around the world as it is to chat with someone around the corner. The second digital revolution was in computation. Analog computers used to fill rooms with gears and pulleys or vacuum tubes and produced answers that accumulated errors the longer they ran. Today, you can carry in your pocket a computer with the power of, was, of what was once a national lab's supercomputer. We are now living through the third, in, the third digital revolution in fabrication. The first two revolutions rapidly expanded access to communication and computation. This one will allow anyone to make almost anything. This time around, it's likely to be even more significant than the first two because it's bringing the programmability of the world of bits out into the world of atoms. The defining application for digital computing was personal computing, which upended the existing computing industry that initially ignored it. Likewise, the defining application emerging for digital fabrication is personal fabrication, which allows consumers to become creators, locally producing rather than purchasing mass-manufactured products. Digital fabrication has a decades-old meaning, referring to computers controlling machines that make things. And it has a much deeper meaning than that, as we'll see in the coming chapters, which is both much newer and much older. The digitization of not just the description, but also the actual construction of an object. As was the case with the earlier digital revolutions, we don't need to wait for the technology to reach its final form to recognize or use it. The third digital revolution can be seen today in the spread of technology for digital fabrication and the impact that it is already having, the subject of this chapter. It can be seen in the historical alignment of all three digital revolutions in chapter 3. It can be seen in the coming research roadmap that'll be in chapter 5. Together, these chapters survey the science and technology required to understand the third digital revolution, providing the background needed to be able to shape it. The exponential change in all three digital revolutions began with weak signals in the first few doublings. Today, the signals for the third digital revolution are more like honking horns, if you're paying attention to them. This chapter examines what is already happening today, introducing Sherry Lassiter's original observation, which we'll call Lass's Law, that the number of fab labs has been doubling every year and a half. We explain what a fab lab is, how to use one, what the applications and implications of these labs are, and how they are organized. This tour through the present is important for seeing the future, because the most significant implication of projecting the continuation of Lass's law, like Moore's law, is to change not just what the technology can do, but who can do it. On this tour, we will meet pioneers who are already using fab labs to produce a range of remarkable things fabricating the physical forms of objects, and programming the functions that the objects can perform. Today, these tasks require access to the tools in a fab lab along with the supply chain that supports it. Over time, the equivalent capabilities will become available to many more people as the progression of performance improvements we'll see in the subsequent chapters decreases the cost and increases the capability of digital fabrication. Fabrication Fab labs are the laboratories for fabrication, which we also think are a bit fabulous. They began as, a as an outreach project from MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms, the CBA, which I direct. CBA was founded to study the boundary between computer science and physical science, a distinction that I have never understood. Computation requires and is used to represent physics. CBA researchers have participated in projects like creating among the first computers to use the strange behavior of microscopic quantum systems to solve important problems faster than a conventional classical computer can. Another CBA collaboration contributed to creating some of the first living organisms designed in a computer. These activities can't be neatly separated into hardware and software. They are intimately integrated. 
The most important conclusion from this research is the recognition of the fundamental convergence of digital communication and computation with fabrication, a concept that will be unpacked in the coming chapters. The initial funding to create CBA came from the National Science Foundation, or NSF, which supported our ambitious proposal to put together a facility that could make and measure things with sizes ranging from molecules to buildings. CBA includes million-dollar research instruments like electron microscopes and X-ray scanners. With that within that facility is a workshop containing $100,000 manufacturing tools, like machining centers, that we use to develop the experimental apparatus. Within the workshop is a collection of $10,000 rapid prototyping tools, like laser cutters, that make parts of the projects. And those, in turn, get used with $1,000 tools to perform processes like molding components. The nesting of these scales is key to understanding fab labs, which fall in the middle of this hierarchy. They represent the core capabilities needed to make not just something, but almost anything. Fab Labs began as an experiment to see what would happen if the most popular of CBA's tools internally become widely available externally. They arose not from a transformative vision, but much more modestly to meet a bureaucratic requirement. When CBA started in 2001, the government had begun enforcing legislation called the Government Performance and Results Act, which required agencies to measure their progress against performance goals and to document their impact in a broader context. NSF responded, in turn, by asking grantees like CBA to show the broader impacts of their work. My colleagues and I, who had no idea how to do that, had encountered an unexpected impact in rural India. On a trip there in 2002, I met S.S. Kalbag, who had run research for Hindustan Laver. He had re when he reached the Hindu life stage when it's traditional to renounce worldly attachments, he ap approached that as a scientist by setting up a school. Vigram or Vigyan Ashram to teach technical skills to dropouts. He intentionally located this in one of the poorest, driest parts of India, Pabal, in western Maharashtra. When I visited him there, he had a long list of local needs that he could have met with the tools in his former lab, but not with the resources available in the small village of Pabal. Rather than invest in expensive, special purpose lab equipment, we began a collaboration to equip their lab with, to make lab instruments for purposes like agricultural testing. That could be called fab lab number zero, the chicken before the egg, or is it the egg before the chicken? It inspired the first full community fab lab that was later opened in Boston. It itself grew into a full fab lab in 2005. Although Kalbag passed away in 2003, that fab lab had fl has flourished under his, his successor, Yogesh Kulkarni, teaching classes, incubating businesses, and supporting the community. To respond to NSF's requirement to show broader impacts, we proposed to base an outreach program on the experiment in Pabal. Our adventurous program managers agreed, and the concept of a fab lab was born. The contents of a fab lab were based on a kind of market research done by running CBA's facility at MIT, incorporating the most useful core set of tools. Today, this suite adds up to about $100,000, weighs around two tons, and fills a room. The fab lab naturally includes a 3D printer, which has been the subject of a great deal of coverage in the popular press, but it is just one of the computer-controlled machines. We'll meet the rest of these in Chapter 5, including a, including a laser cutter that's much faster than the 3D printer, a large milling machine that can make things like furniture, a small precision milling machine that can make electronic circuit boards and molds for casting parts, tools to assemble and program electronics, a scanner to digitize objects, and computers for design and modeling. When microwave ovens were introduced, they were the basis for the 1950s version of the push-button kitchen of the future. You, of course, probably still use a stove, an oven, and maybe a toaster, along with a microwave. All these tools just heat food, but each is needed to make a range of recipes. Working in a fab lab today is like cooking in a kitchen. Think of the 3D printer as the microwave oven of the fab lab. You could use only the microwave, but you would be missing the capabilities of the other appliances. Just as a basic set of processes is assumed in cooking, a basic set is assumed in digital fabrication. You can effectively consider the whole fab lab to be a machine. Data goes in and things go out. Things go in and data comes out. 
what will change over time is not what can be made, but r rather what's required to make something. A fab lab today uses bulk materials that can be locally sourced, like wood or cardboard, along with a small set of globally sourced, high-tech consumables, like precision bearings and computer chips. The latter can't yet be made in the lab, but that will become possible in the coming years. The transition will be continuous, as more and more of the supply chain to support a fab lab gets replaced with fewer and fewer inputs. When we were planning to set up the first of these fab labs, Bill Mitchell, then MIT's thoughtful dean of architecture, suggested that I talk to Mel King in Boston. Mel is a community activist who literally helped invent mixed-use urban development by the seat of his pants. He led what was called the Tent City Encampment, which forced a developer to include affordable housing and community space in a planned parking garage. Mel's South End Technology Center, SETC, in the resulting complex, went on to become a pioneer in electronic media at a time when mass media wasn't telling stories of the inner city. Then, SETC innovated in computing access when the internet threatened to bypass the community. So, it was natural to progress from digital communications and computing to fabrication, opening a fab lab there in 2003. As Mel says, quote, the rear wheels of the train don't catch up to the front wheels of the train unless something dramatic happens to the train, end quote, meaning that each of these interventions was a disruptive event that challenged the role of technology in society. Putting a fab lab at SETC was the extent of our vision. After it opened, we expected to just return to research, but a strong Ghanaian community in Boston, after seeing Mel's lab, collaborated to bring lab to a lab to Sekondi Takarati on Ghana's coast in 2004. From one to two, then four, the number of fab labs has continued to double every year, and a half for a decade. Every time we opened a fab lab, someone else wanted one. Sherry Lassiter was the first to notice this exponential trend. She has managed the fab lab program for CBA and leads the fab foundation that was spun off to support its growth. Lass came to me with a background in producing science programs on television. She was interested in producing the science itself, which is what she has done ever since with the Fab Lab Network. In 2005, I wrote the book Fab after the first few doublings of Fab Labs. That year, I was approached to be the first interview in a new magazine called Make, founded by Dale Dougherty. He coined the term maker to describe the emerging community of hobbyists connecting around computation with fabrication using the kinds of tools found in a Fab Lab. He started hosting gatherings called Maker Fairs in 2006. The biggest of these, in San Mateo, California, grew from a modest beginning to attract 145,000 visitors in 2015. Also in 2006, Jim Newton founded Tech Shop to provide shared access to digital fabrication tools beyond the reach of most individuals. These shops are run with a paid membership model. As of 2016, there are 10 of these. More informally, makerspaces and hackerspaces started to spread to provide a place for like-minded individuals to gather. The spaces vary widely in what they offer, but they now number in the thousands. The next year, in 2007, CBA launched a mobile fab lab to bring tools to people rather than vice versa. Thomas Diaz, Amy Sun, and Kenny Chung, who we'll meet later, memorably commissioned the lab by driving it to the Burning Man gathering in Nevada's Black Rock Desert, for rapid prototyping on the playa. The mobile lab subsequently seeded a network within the network, roving fab labs touring regions of the country. All these fab labs were early manifestations of the third digital revolution. Two things distinguish fab labs within this growing ecosystem. First, rather than each one being different, fab labs all share the same evolving set of core capabilities, allowing people and projects to be shared among them. The computer network pioneer Bob Metcalf observed what is now known as Metcalf's Law. The value of a computer connected to the internet is proportional to the square of the number of computers in that network. He proposed that it's the square rather than merely the number of computers because that's how many pairs can talk to each other. Some kinds of makerspaces are based on a membership model that's like joining a gym. Gyms provide individual access to expensive exercise equipment. There's no direct benefit if someone is exercising elsewhere. 
but the value of being connected to the internet or working in a fab lab increases when other computers are connected to the internet or when other people are working in fab labs. Both people and projects are mobile in the fab lab network, sharing content that allows them to accomplish collectively what they could not do individually. The other distinguishing feature of Fab Labs is the coordinated evolution of their contents according to the Digital Fabrication Research Roadmap presented in Chapter 5. They began with a carefully curated inventory of common machines, materials, components, and programs, and are now migrating to open designs for hardware and software developed by and for Fab Labs toward the goal of a Fab Labs being able to make another Fab Lab. Although the cost of each type of machine in a fab lab has come down over time, the ambition of what can be made in a fab lab has gone up at the same rate, so the overall cost has stayed roughly consistent on the scale of a community resource. Together, these attributes allow the collection of fab labs to function as a network. Individually, each site isn't a critical mass, but the collection of them is. No one is pushing anyone to start a fab lab, but sites continue to join the network for the benefits they get from being a part of something larger. The biggest surprise for me has been how similar rather than how different the uses of fab labs are around the world. Mel King captured this when we took him, a community activist from Boston, to the far north of Norway to meet the Sami-descended herder Hakan Carlsen. After spending just a few days in Hakan's fab lab, Mel commented that it was just around the corner. He might have been a few hours above the Arctic Circle, but he recognized the same hopes and fears as those he found in his own urban lab in Boston. Common to fab labs is how they mix ages, from very old to very young, and mix applications spanning education, entertainment, and business. In this diversity, they're serving a role analogous to libraries. Andrew Carnegie invested in setting up town libraries around the turn of the last century, 1900. By the time he was done, there were about 2,500 such libraries dotting the nation. The overall mission of a library is literacy, expanding access to knowledge. But within that mission, they're used for purposes ranging from playgroups to classes to research to civics. From what was initially a novelty, libraries are now an expected component of a civilized community. You can think of fab labs as doing the same, but they now aim at a new form of literacy, going from bits to atoms. Education. Once CBA had set up its digital fabrication research facility, we had a problem. Because these tools are conventionally segregated by both discipline and the scale at which they operate, it would have taken a lifetime of, lifetime of MIT classes to learn how to use them all. As a shortcut in 2001, I started a new class, How to Make Almost Anything. The class was aimed at a small group of students doing digital fabrication research, but every year since then, hundreds of students have shown up for the class, just wanting to learn how to make things. Along with mastering individual skills, they did projects to integrate these skills. One of the stars the first year was Kelly Dobson, who went on to become the head of the digital and media department at the Rhode Island School of Design. She made a wearable device that could save up screams and play them back later when it was convenient to let them out. Hmm? A few years later, Meijin Yoon, who later became the head of the Department of Architecture at MIT, made a dress replete with sensors and spines that could defend a wearer's personal space. These kinds of inventive projects happen so consistently, year after year, I realized that the students in the class were answering a question that I had never asked. What is digital fabrication good for? While I was asking how to do it, and not why, they were showing that just as the killer app for digital computing was personal computing, the killer app for digital fabrication is personal fabrication. The point was not to make what you could buy in stores, it was to make what you could not products for a market as small as one person. In the same way that the arrival of CBA's research tools presented a training problem that was solved by the How to Make Almost Anything class, the spread of Fab Labs made training a problem on a global scale. Bright kids would learn skills in Fab Labs that were far ahead of local educational opportunity, and then they'd fall off a cliff. Hans Christian Bruvald was considering something of a pro was considered something of a problem in the local school system of Langsedet in the far north of Norway. 
Because he had already mastered everything the teachers were teaching, he wasn't that attentive of a student. He started going to Hakan's fab lab instead, which is where I met him and showed him a few demonstration projects from my How to Make Almost Anything class. When I next returned, I was astounded that he had integrated the, integrated the techniques into a toy robotic truck, including the design of the body, incorporating the motors and their controllers, and adding a windshield display. In South Africa, something similar happened when we opened a fab lab in what had been an apartheid-era township, so Sean Gouvet. There, I was startled to learn that a local girl, Shaspiso Monaheng, had been using the lab to remotely follow along with the work of my classes at MIT. The usual message for someone like Hans Christian or Shapizo is, you're smart, so you have to leave now. Bright students like them have to go far away to study somewhere more advanced. But this migration takes the most value pe valuable people away from where they're most needed. We initially tried to pair with local schools around the world to fill this void, but consistently found that an even greater limitation than a lack of technical skills was how a school's regimented approach to education can stifle creativity. For these reasons, we started what's now called the Fab Academy. It grew out of a video link that I initially had set up so that Fab Labs could remotely sit in on the How to Make Almost Anything classes at MIT. When there were more Fab Labs attending than students in person, we spun off the remote sessions as a separate program. The local mentors, who had initially been the remote students, proved to be essential. New students joined work groups in their local fab labs where they worked with these mentors, their own peers, and the machines. We then connected everyone globally by video for interactive lectures and collaborative content sharing. In computing terms, you can think of MIT as a mainframe where you go for processing. It works well for a very limited population. You can think of massive open online classes, MOOCs, as corresponding to the time-sharing era in computing, when users sat at isolated terminals connected to central mainframes. In the Fab Academy model, that we stumbled on is more like the internet, linking nodes in a learning network that grows at its edges rather than at the center. Initially, I directly supervised all the students. Then, as the model grew, I supervised the mentors who supervised the students. As it grew further still, I supervised super nodes that emerged to supervise regional labs, which in turn supervised the students. In this, the model is again like the internet, which handles the routing of information in a tree with trunks, branches, and leaves. And like the internet, any node can talk to one another. The heart of the weekly Fab Academy cycle is a giant video conference where everyone can see and hear everyone else. The conference includes a lively discussion of successes and failures in the preceding week and an interactive introduction to new material for the next week. All of this collaboration is supported by a distributed work group led by Luciana Asinari rather than a central office. This structure maintains a direct traceability in the web of relationships to maintain quality control. But we needed a way to document that, which led me to approach Educause, the group of IT professionals in higher education that runs the .edu domain. They require institutions wanting a .edu domain for their websites to be accredited. The accreditors that I spoke with appreciated what we were doing, but explained that giving the Fab Academy a .edu domain name would violate their rules. Because they accredit organizations that have a physical place, the accreditors have no way to recognize a network. But the accreditors then said something helpful, pretend. By that, they meant we should have students build portfolios documenting the skills they're learning, and the group would eventually catch, catch up to us to recognize the student's work and our evaluation. Although the Fab Academy has no global accreditation, regional accreditations are now beginning to be overlaid on the little diploma that the Fab Academy awards. And we found that for future admissions, employment, or investment, your portfolios can matter more than a credential from a relatively unknown body. The cycle of content and evaluation takes about eight months to cover, but a student's progress is determined by the mastery of the skills rather than by their time in class. Some students have taken a few years to finish everything. The level of the students has ranged from homeschooled prodigy prodigies to college students to people doing this instead of college, to mid-career professionals, to late-career retraining, to retirement avocations. This global linking of local learning work groups balances the distributed nature of fab labs with the need for mentoring.
Absent good mentoring, bad ideas can propagate. The term maker has come to have both a negative and a positive connotation along the lines of enthusiastic but not well informed. A staple of the maker movement is the Arduino, a $20 small computer board used to build intelligence into projects including reading sensors, controlling output devices, and communicating with networks. The Arduino originally in turn was based on a computer chip family called AVRs, which were designed by two Norwegian students. After introducing the Arduino, the Fab Academy shows how to make such a board in a fab lab for a few dollars in parts. Students then learn how to use other computer chips, from the size of a rice grain up to something that can run a desktop operating system. Another staple of the maker movement is the 3D printer. After showing students how to use one, the Fab Academy shows them how to use all the other digital fabrication tools that can operate more quickly or make larger things, stronger things, or things with finer features. Then students learn how to make a 3D printer. These examples each provide a path from introducing easy skills to mastering hard ones. Do-it-yourself, or DIY, is a recipe for standing on the toes rather than the shoulders of your predecessors. Do it together, or do it with others, builds on their accumulated knowledge. We unexpectedly found the Fab Academy to be at the heart of a virtuous cycle. Each cycle would propagate best practices throughout the Fab Lab network, building a core collaborating community of local mentors and providing a cohort of trained students that then became available to help with new labs and programs. The Fab Academy was developed to teach digital fabrication, but much of what we had assembled wasn't specific to that content. The infrastructure could be used for any kind of distributed rather than distance learning. I had initially missed the deep connection between communication, computation, fabrication, and learning. Whereas digital communication lets us interact globally and digital computation lets us, lets us share knowledge, the addition of digital fabrication lets us exchange things as well as ideas. With the core set of tools in a fab lab, it's then possible to make whatever else is needed, effect effectively bringing the campus to the student. George Church, one of the world's leading geneticists, was interested in reaching students beyond those who could fit into his classes at Harvard. This thought led George to add a second distributed class in the Fab Lab network, how to grow almost anything. Digital fabrication and biological fabrication connect at two levels. Biologists can use a Fab Lab to make the tools needed in a bio lab. Biological equipment is often both overpriced and cumbersome. The same techniques used to make machines in fab labs have been used to make things like thermal cyclers for DNA amplification and liquid handling robots to program reactions. At a deeper level, biology itself can be used for fabrication. As we'll see in chapter 3, biological processes are fundamentally digital, and we are increasingly learning how to program these processes as fab labs and bio labs converge. Olafur Eliasson is one of the world's foremost artists. Like George, he wanted to extend his influence beyond the students he could directly teach in his studio. But his interest was not in how to make things, but why, leading him to begin developing another distributed class, Why Make Almost Anything, to explore the influences on and impacts of the making process. My student, Nadja Peek, jokingly, jokingly called this growing collection of programs the Academy of Almost Anything. The name stuck, or the Academy for short, and it is now managed by Jean-Michel Molinar, who started the Grenoble Fab Lab. Each of its offerings follows the same model of local work groups, with mentors connected globally for interactive lectures from world leaders with collaborative content sharing. While Fab Labs were spreading around the world, I helped plan a new building at MIT. The task took 10 years from start to finish, cost $100 million, and fits a few hundred people. Each of the thousand Fab Labs that emerged over those 10 years has a community of 100 or so users. These numbers pose an obvious question. Which activities justify the $100 million versus the $100,000 investment? The existing organization of MIT is based on an assumption of scarcity. To manage access to our tools and labs, books and libraries, and faculty time, we reject most applicants and crowd into a corner of Cambridge where there is a battle over every square foot of space. 
It's a false dichotomy to consider the alternative an isolated student sitting in front of a computer connected to an online learning platform. We've consistently found in the FAB Academy that for students to succeed, they need to be in learning communities. The real alternative is distributed rather than distance education, as the FAB Academy backed into doing. The follow-up question is then, how much of what is done at a place like MIT can be distributed this way, and how much needs to be centralized? I'd say about half. Whenever we open a fab lab, we find the same kind of remarkable, inventive people who I work with at MIT. They are everywhere, appearing so consistently in fab labs because they're unable to find peers, mentors, and tools. About half the activities on MIT's campus could be done in a fab lab setting. The other half differ in that they require much more expensive tools, like the nanoscience instruments we're using to develop molecular scale assemblers. Ooh. The skills and knowledge to use these expensive tools are so specialized that it makes sense to do these activities all in one place. These two types of spaces aren't in opposition. You can view all this as a tree, with $10,000 maker spaces, $100,000 fab labs, million-dollar super fab labs, and $10 million research labs. But, but it's by growing a tree out rather than up that we scale to tap the brain power of the planet. Seymour Papier is the father of computers and education. He studied in Switzerland with the pioneering child psychologist Jean Piaget, who argued that children learn like scientists by doing experiments and testing theories. Seymour then came to MIT to get access to early, real-time digital computers, wanting to expand the scope of experimentation available to a child. This was an improbable thought at the time. These computers were expensive, room-filling beasts that were difficult to use. To provide a friendlier interface, Seymour developed robotic turtles that he connected to the computer, and a language, Logo, that let children tell the turtles what to do. One of the people who came to work with Seymour is Alan Kay, who went on to develop the modern computing paradigms of graphical user interfaces and laptops. These design principles weren't originally intended for business executives to balance spreadsheets, they were for children to discover. Another person who studied with Seymour is Mitch Resnick, who developed LEGO's Mindstorms kit, named after a book that Seymour wrote, which moved the computer into a programmable LEGO brick. Mitch also led the creation of the popular Scratch software for kids to program. As Fab Labs started doubling and the Fab Academy began to grow, Seymour came by to see me to talk about them. I had considered the whole Fab Lab thing to be a historical accident, but he made a gesture of poking his side. He said that it had been a thorn in his side that kids could program the motion of the turtle, but could not make the turtle itself. This had been his goal all along. Viewed that way, learning in Fab Labs follows directly from the work he started decades ago. It's not an accident. There's a natural progression from going to MIT to play with a central computer, to going to a store to purchase and play with a toy containing a computer, to going to a fab lab to play with creating a computer. Application. Once you're equipped with access to both the tools in a fab lab and the ability to use them, it's possible to locally produce the kinds of products that are being today purchased at the, long, at the end of long supply chains. Along with the benefits of using local skills and creating local jobs, a fab lab allows on-demand production and customization to meet local needs. Here are examples of how fab labs are being used, a survey that's intended to be illustrative but not exhaustive, or exhausting. Craft. The Cook Inlet Tribal Council, CITC, is a tribal nonprofit serving Alaska's Cook Inlet region. The Alaska native communities that it serves have a profound cultural tradition or have profound cultural traditions, but also serious issues with unemployment, alcoholism, and suicide rates. CITC hosts a fab lab that opened in 2013 and is focused on merging culture and technology to serve a new generation that is growing up surrounded by digital devices that frequently have little local context. The White House's 2014 Native Youth Report found that the high school graduation rate among Native high school students is the lowest of any demographic group across all schools. Benjamin Hunter Francis II was 16 and at risk of becoming one of those statistics when he moved to Anchorage from the remote village of Marshall, Alaska, population 349. 
Far behind in school, he had a different sense of culture from kids born and raised in the city. He became a fixture in the fab lab, using it both for classes and for personal projects. One project was a wooden sled based on traditional designs but made with computerized tools and engraved with images from his community. For another project, he used the laser cutter to do marquetry that's traditionally done laboriously by hand carving. Along with catching up and now enjoying school, he feels that the fab lab is helping him keep in touch with his ancestors' traditions that he wants to keep alive. Haystack Mountain School of Crafts is one of the premier artist colonies in the United States. Here, renowned glassblowers, blacksmiths, potters, printmakers, and other artists retreat to this collection of studios on the coast of Maine to practice and teach their crafts. In 2009, after the then-director Stu Kestenbaum proposed as an experiment to introduce digital fabrication tools, we set up a temporary fab lab there. The response was a bit like when Bob Dylan showed up at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965 with an electric guitar, an event that one observer said electrified half the audience and electrocuted the other half. Half of the artists were horrified by the intrusion of technology into a temple of traditional craft. The other half were horrified by the other half for not recognizing that all their practices rested on technologies that were once new and that this was just another iteration. So many artists have had life-changing experiences in the Fab Lab that, in 2011, it became a permanent addition, and the only controversy was contention for time on the laser cutter. But rather than being viewed as one of the crafts, the Fab Lab tools were used across all of them. And rather than replacing an artist's skill, the lab was used to amplify them. Artists would typically design in traditional media, then use the Fab Lab to embody their work in ways that would be difficult to do by hand. Andrea Descho was a, visit, was a visiting visual artist who makes gorgeous, intricate paper cutouts and prints. She starts with sketches of these, and then a laborious process of cutting follows. In the Fab Lab, she could scan her sketches and rapidly turn them into objects, with features that were both larger and finer than she could have done by hand. Most interesting for her was the collaboration with the machines. They didn't always do what she expected. Sometimes the results were better than she intended. For example, while cutting out a design with a tool path that unintentionally moved in steps larger than the tool, she found that the material left, behi the material left behind created what looked like an evocative energy field around the figures. Universidad Anhawak Mexico Norte opened the first fab lab in Mexico in 2012. It has a strong focus on social impact, empowering marginalized women who make Mexican crafts. One of his first projects was with a single mother, her six daughters, and several of their cousins, the Areola family. Although underemployed, the Areolas knew how to make handmade chocolate. But the presentation was crude, limiting their ability to sell it. They were able to use the Fab Lab to make molds to form the chocolate and produce custom packaging to present it. The result was a much higher quality product that considerably increased their sales while also saving time and effort. Fab Lab Kamakura, founded by Hiroya Tanaka and Yuka Watanabe in 2011, occupies a 150-year-old Japanese wooden kura building that had been used as a sake brewery. This lab focuses on connecting traditional Jap Japanese crafts with modern tools. One project developed the use of Japanese Urushi lacquer to coat the output from 3D printers for a beautiful, tough, glossy finish. Another studied the construction of the building itself. One of the students working in the lab, Kenji Kanasaki, identified 54 types of joints in traditional Japanese word working, far beyond the simple tabbed joints commonly used and overused in fab labs. He turned these into a set of reference design files that could be, be made with the tools in a fab lab, creating a dialogue between the tradition of Japanese joinery and the current practice of digital fabrication. Furniture David Yamnitsky took the How to Make Almost Anything class in 2013. One of my favorite assignments in the class is to have the students make something big. This assignment is given when I teach the students how to use the largest tool, an automated milling machine that can handle a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood given to each student. Yamnitsky's girlfriend wanted to work at a standing desk, but couldn't find a suitable one to buy, so he made a custom one for that replacement. To make the desk, he designed and cut out a kit of parts, similar to the flat pack furniture bought from a big box store. 
but rather than being mass-produced, every piece can be different. So many other people saw his project and requested variants of it that it became a Kickstarter project, funded many times over. One of my students, Amanda Gasei, had the same difficulty finding a standing desk that she liked. Unlike David's desk, the one she wanted would be filled with storage underneath for her progress, or for her work in progress. After designing the desk, she was able to plot it out and assemble it in an afternoon. A fab lab opened in Rwanda in 2016. In Kigali, furniture is made and bought in the Gakinjiro district, a, methy, a messy place filled with groups of guys using manual tools. A young woman named Queen, or Raina Imanishimwe, discovered that she could bypass this furniture district and make her designs in the fab lab as David and Amanda had done. She proceeded to populate the fab lab with, it, with its own custom furniture, which she made with wood recycled from a kitchen ceiling. After attending the Fab Academy in 2012, Ohad Mayuas then opened a fab lab in Holon, south of Tel Aviv, in 2013. Holon is a poor neighborhood with a large immigration, immigrant population and a high crime rate. Next door to the fab lab is a community center that was meant to be a safe haven for local kids but was a neglected, gloomy space. In 2014, he used the Fab Lab to do an extreme makeover in which the kids got to design functional furniture for the space and then, in an intense week, produce everything. The result was not only a lively space that they could now take pride in, but also the kids' inspiration to grow up to become designers and makers. Housing The Shelter 2.0 project was started by two carpenters, Robert Bridges and Bill Young, who were early adopters of digital fabrication. That experience led Bill to work for ShopBot, maker of a popular large-format milling machine used in fab labs. Inspired by stories of the need for rapidly erected shelters for disaster response, they were struck by the possibility of producing it on-site, on-demand, and customized to individual needs. They came up with an open-source design, shared the files, and did a trial of sending flat-packed shelters to Haiti, where they were rapidly erected by the recipients. These shelters were much more substantial than the surrounding informal housing and were produced at a cost of just a few dollars per square foot. When he was growing up in Harlem, Larry Sass's love of architecture led him to MIT, where he was one of the first faculty members working with CBA. He became interested in the potential that digital fabrication held for mass customization of housing, bringing custom construction from a select few to everyone. After seeing people in New Orleans living in Federal Emergency Management Agency trailers a year after Hurricane Katrina, he began meeting with local homeowners. The result was his development of a digitally fabricated house for New Orleans. This was in the shotgun style, which has been reflected, suggested to reflect African and Haitian influences in American house design, with ornamentation based on existing shotgun houses in New Orleans. After testing the design with a laser-cut model, he, with help from Bill Young, then scaled up and cut out the parts to make it full size. This version, which needed only a rubber mallet for its assembly, was first erected and then exhibited in the courtyard of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 2008. Vicente Gualart founded the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, site of the first fab lab in Barcelona, and later became the city's chief architect. With Thomas Dees and Danny Ibanez leading a team from 25 countries, they created a Fab Lab house that won the People's Choice Award in the Solar Decathlon Europe in 2010. Although several other projects have sought to make houses with giant 3D printers, an approach that requires an enormous capital investment and has had limited progress, this team instead cut out unique kits of parts that could be assembled on site to erect a complete solar house, including its contents. Gualart's design optimized solar power production and natural ventilation as an integral part of the construction. The shape, variously, variously described as a peanut house, a cinnamon submarine, forest zeppelin, or whale belly, efficiently produced more energy than it consumed. Along with receiving orders to replicate the house, the team turned it into an adjustable family of house designs that could be varied from, from a modest cottage to a large villa. Flight all, of all the types of robots made in fab labs, the most popular may be those that fly, drones. The interest in drones ranges from recreational to professional. Fab labs can make a drone's mechanical structure, 
the propellers, the power electronics to drive the motor, the control system to guide it, and the communication system to talk to it. By making these elements in the Fab Lab, makers can customize a drone for a mission rather than simply selecting a gadget from a catalog. Technically, the motors could also be made in the Fab Lab, but motors are mass-produced commodities that don't require this kind of customization. Matt Norris is an aerospace engineer who started a Fab Lab in Tulsa. One project there brings in local school, school teachers who learn how to make as well as fly drones. The teachers then bring this experience to their students, helping interest them in learning about all the techniques in a drone rather than using it as a black box. Shirag Rangolia studied architecture in India before attending the Fab Academy in Barcelona in 2014. He developed a drone for his final project, integrating it with a programmable camera mount that Aldo Salazzo had developed for his final project. The two men have since turned their project into an organization, Networking Environmental Robotics, or NERO. Rather than selling drones, NERO provides the data its drones can collect. For Barcelona's Department of Urban Development, NERO provides NDVI, or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, measurements to help the city map and manage its plants. In Costa Rica, the organization produces agricultural maps to help combat the proliferation of pests. Doing it this way is both cheaper and more easily customized than satellite imagery. Danielle Ingracia was working as a researcher at an Italian IT company when first he visited a fab lab in Torino. He was so inspired by what he saw that it led him to enroll in the Fab Academy in 2015 at the Open Dot Lab in Milan. His final project was making another drone, this one incorporating a navigation system that allows it to reach destinations while avoiding obstacles. He enjoyed the experience so much that he quit his day job and was subsequently hired through the Fab Economy website, a commerce platform for Fab Labs, by the Rhine Wall University of Applied Sciences. Along with running their Fab Lab and serving as a Fab Academy instructor, he's continuing to investigate drones. He is currently creating a family of various sized drones that can be made in a Fab Lab and is integrating higher level reasoning into their control systems. Jonathan Ledgard was the longtime Africa correspondent of The Economist. Now based at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, he's working with the British architect Lord Norman Foster on developing drone ports in Africa. Foster and Partners has designed some of the world's largest airports. These drone ports will be the smallest. Only a third of Africans live within two kilometers of an all-season road. Rather than pave the continent, the goal is to provide aerial connectivity, concentrating initially on high-value payloads, including medicine and spare parts for critical machines like water pumps. Ledgard and Foster are starting in Rwanda, a company that combines a rough geographical landscape with good government. I was in Rwanda, when I was in Rwanda to deploy the first Fab Lab there, Ledgard approached me at a meeting of African leaders and asked about putting Fab Labs in these drone ports to repair the drones. I explained that they could go a step further and make the drones in the drone ports. These aren't simple hovering quadcopters. For long-range efficiency, they're fixed-wing aircraft, requiring the production of three-dimensional tooling forms that are used to lay up fiber resin composites to make high-performance structures. My student, Grace Copplestone, returned to Rwanda to work with the Fab Lab on an initial demonstration of the processes to produce a drone. That experience inspired the creation of a local drone development group in Rwanda. The biggest drones of all are made by a former student, Yael Maguire, who heads Facebook's Connectivity Lab. With the wingspan of an airliner, these aircraft are for long-duration, high-altitude, solar-powered flight to provide global internet access. Today, these drones require a manufacturing investment along the lines of what's needed to make an airliner. But as the research on discreetly assembling large-scale composites progresses, as we'll see in Chapter 5, even these will come within the reach of a future fab lab. Communications In 2002, I was approached by the Norwegian telecommunications company Telenor about participating in a smart home project in Oslo. I explained that there was such a proliferation of these projects then that few people knew I would be interested. I then asked if Telenor was doing anything different. After some awkward shuffling, the person mentioned that the company was working with an eccentric herder who was putting cell phones on sheep and reindeer in the far north of Norway. 
That herder was Hakon Carlson, and he was doing this to track his flocks. Traditional Sami heart herding is nomadic, following the animals. With changing patterns of land use, the herders increasingly stay fixed, but wanted to remain connected remotely. Hakon's project led to a collaboration to set up a fab lab, initially focused on focusing on making the antennas and radios to extend wireless networks beyond the reach of cell towers. The project was then picked up at a fab lab in Pretoria, South Africa, to extend internet access to where it was not easily available from the heavily regulated telecom provider. My student Amy Sun, with Keith Berkobin and Smari McCarthy, now representing the Pirate Party in Iceland's parliament, next brought the project to a fab lab in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, where there was no internet access at all. The Jalalabad project grew to encompass a trial connecting 45 sites, with the longest link between them being 6 kilometers. This project, which had come to be called FabFi, was then brought to a fab lab in Kenya, where it was deployed on a commercial basis to more than 50 sites. Instead of a communications infrastructure set up and sold by a large commercial carrier, this was community wireless operating regionally. To connect one of the, to one of these networks, for about $100, a fab lab can assemble a single board computer with a small screen and keyboard to make a single custom laptop. But you can provide access for much less than that. Max Lebowski and David Craner, who founded the 3D printer company Form Labs, took the How to Make Almost Anything class in 2009. They continued working on what was called a thinner client. A thin client is an old idea in computing. It is a simple computer that has no local storage and keeps everything on remote servers. The modern version of that is the popular Chromebook, which can run just a web browser. Lebowski and Cranor designed a minimal thin client computer that could be made in a fab lab with a bill of materials that cost just a few hundred dollars in parts. It could generate video for a screen, could interface with a keyboard, and could communicate with the internet. This computer could be mass-produced, but because they were made locally, each one could vary in its specifications, such as optionally adding local storage, varying the graphics resolution, incorporating assistive technologies, or including a radio for portability. And by making it locally, its makers gained the skills as well as the economic activity of a local investment. Machines. The technical goal of a fab lab is to be able to make another fab lab. A small precision tabletop milling machine is one of the most popular tools in a fab lab today, and the one that I use the most. In 2011, after taking a class that I periodically teach on machine building, how to make something that makes almost anything, Nadja Peak and Jonathan Ward developed a version of one of these machines that could be made in a fab lab, the MTM Snap where MTM is short for machines that make. A larger milling machine is used to cut the parts out of high-density polyethylene, a high-strength recyclable plastic. Rather than being held together with fasteners, these are designed with flexible couplings built in so that the whole machine just snaps together. It's driven by custom motors that are mass-produced, with the lead screws used to drive the machine built in. And the machine can cut out its own circuit boards for the motor controllers. Nadia and Jonathan's design inspired commercial products from HandyBot and the other machine company, and the personal fabrication roadmap that we'll return to in Chapter 5. The same skills show up in making machines that make many other kinds of things, like food. Food production doesn't require breakthroughs in molecular biology. Improvements can come simply from the better integration of how it has been done for millennia. Guillaume Tacy, working at a fab lab in Valdara, in the hills outside Barcelona, that focuses on sustainable production, developed a system for aquaponics as his project for the Fab Academy in 2016. Aquaponics is based on a symbiotic relationship between the aquaculture of fish and the hydroponic growth of plants, with the fish fertilizing the plants and the plants filtering the water for the fish. This kind of system can be much more efficient than sticking seeds into a field. With aquaponics, you can precisely control the agricultural inputs and can expand your system vertically rather than horizontally for dense urban use. But it requires housing for the plants and fish, plumbing to circulate the water between them, and sensors, heaters, and lights in a control system. All this aquaponics equipment is commercially available, but by making it in the fab lab, Tacy could customize it to what he wanted to grow, along with saving the overhead of buying it from a remote vendor. 
his system has developed into the Aqua Pioneers project. With this system so far, he and his colleagues have grown their own lettuce, celery, beans, broccoli, cauliflower, strawberries, mint, basil, and coriander in the fab lab. Implications After someone asks what, a, what fab labs can produce, the next question is usually who pays for it. Although that's typically posed as an obstacle to the wider adoption of fab labs, lurking in this question is an even greater opportunity in the economic impact that fab labs can have. The first fab labs that CBA deployed followed the same financial model that Andrew Carnegie used with his libraries. We donated the equipment and, its, and installed it. The sites had to commit to providing the space and the people to run it. Along with stretching our initial investment, this commitment proved to be essential in establishing a local sense of ownership. Since then, fab labs have been funded by a variety of sources, public, private, philanthropic, for profit, but they generally all have to take over their own running costs. The obvious way to assume your running costs is to sell things made in the lab. A factor of five is the typical ratio between how much a commercial product sells for and how much its materials cost, given the overhead of all the steps, from design to manufacturing to assembly to shipping to sales. You can cut out much of those steps as costs when they're all done at the same place in time locally. Given the opportunity for both cost reduction and customization, we paired successful entrepreneurs with Fab Lab inventors to build businesses around their prototypes. Our efforts were pretty consistently a failure. The entrepreneurs felt that the inventors weren't following their instructions, and the inventors felt that the entrepreneurs weren't telling them anything useful. It was hard to make enough of anything within a lab to sustain a business. And although some labs did manage to send their designs off for mass production, this step defeated the goal of bringing back the economic activity. The problem was that this approach was a version of fighting the last war. Recall that it took Google a number of, a number of years to settle on the model of giving away its search capabilities and selling the benefits of searching through targeted advertising. In the same way, the most interesting fab lab business models don't sell things that are made, they sell the benefits of making them. For example, Blair Evans Lab in Detroit works with at-risk youth, including pregnant teens and kids in the juvenile justice system. An important part of his funding comes from showing that the investment to engage these kids in the fab lab delivers better life outcomes than does the spending on existing social services. What he's producing is the transformation of individuals. These models require as much invention as the technology does, but are not yet taught in the canon of business schools. Successful fab labs have settled on an all-of-the-above approach to funding, with a mix of open time for the community, restric restricted time for members, teaching classes, supporting businesses, and producing infrastructure. This approach has been a feature rather than a bug, because any one of these sources of funding in isolation limits the lab. There are synergies across them. In common to all of these funding models is the need for the lab to be part of a larger network. A single lab doesn't have to have the ability to offer this full range of activities. Funding for fab labs could be separated into for-profit versus non-profit models, but at its heart is an even bigger idea that could be called post-profit. The loss of jobs to globalization and automation and the damages done by an economic race to the bottom underpin social and political upheavals around the world. Yet, implicit in all sides of the debate over competing financial and social models is an assumption about the nature of work. For many people, it means traveling away from home to get a job they'd rather not be doing, producing a product designed by someone they don't know for someone they'll never see, to make money to buy what they need and want. What if you could skip all that and just make for yourself? There's a precedent for what appear to be economic facts of life turning out to rest on impl implicit technological assumptions. Peak oil, the long projected moment when oil production declines, was seen as a looming crisis. But not projected was that peak oil appears to be happening even sooner than expected because of the improving economics of renewables rather than the absence of oil. What if we are now approaching peak money when the ability of a country to meet the needs of its population is no longer measured by the output of its businesses? This vision of consumers becoming creators resulted in the appointment of, Vinci of Vincente Gallart, founder of Barcelona's first fab lab in the, in the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, as the city's chief architect in 2011. 
the economic disruption was particularly acute there, with a youth unemployment rate exceeding 50%. A whole generation had no realistic prospect of finding work and living independently. Even so, ships continue to arrive in the harbor carrying products made far away, and trash trucks leave the city with waste destined for the dumps. Gallart describes the current city as being based on converting products to trash. His goal is for electronic bits to come and go freely, but for the atoms to stay in the city. He wants the city to make the transition from products in and trash out to data in and data out. To accomplish this, Barcelona is setting up fab labs around the city as part of the urban infrastructure. In the same way that a city is expected to provide clean water and electricity, they're providing the means to make. This approach wasn't uniformly embraced. In a poor immigrant district at the edge of the city, Cuidad Meridiana, there was a protest in which the community occupied the proposed site and, commanded a food and demanded a food bank instead. The disagreement was resolved as the protesters came to understand that they could use a community fab lab to actually help them grow food, to make toys for their children instead of buying them, or to start businesses instead of searching for work. Barcelona hosted Fab 10, the 10th gathering of the Fab Lab Network, in 2014. At that event, the then-mayor Xavier Trias pushed a button to start a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. Based on the digital fabrication research roadmap, they began by going from one Fab Lab in the city to one in each of the 10 districts. The effort ends when the city can produce what it consumes. This goal can be, could be viewed as a return to the city-state, not out of Catalan separatism, but because neither Madrid nor Brussels has much on offer to help with Barcelona's problems, so the people of Barcelona are finding their own solutions. The difference this time around is that they're not doing it in isolation, but rather as part of a global network. In 2013, Representative Bill Foster, a Democrat from Illinois, first submitted legislation to do something similar to the Barcelona program in the United States, on a national scale. Foster has a remarkable background, first starting a business that pioneered computer-controlled stage lighting, then as a physicist leading the design of major components of the giant Fermilab particle accelerator, and then as a rare scientist in Congress. His National Fab Lab Network Act is written not as an appropriation, but as the chartering of a national network of local labs in the national interest. Instead of an isolated resource inaccessible to most people, a national fab lab initiative would complement the existing labs by bringing the lab to the people. In an era of extreme political polarization, Foster's co-sponsors come from urban and rural districts, representing both Democrats and Republicans. It is a rare issue today that can cross the aisle, and it didn't come to a vote in that session because the U.S. Congress was operating at something less than peak efficiency. But the legislation is being resubmitted and has already inspired private commitments that are aligned with its goals, starting with a $10 million pledge from Chevron to the Fab Foundation to set up Fab Labs in communities where Chevron works. CBA has a mobile Fab Lab that we brought to the White House for the first Maker Fair there in 2014. It was parked right outside the Oval Office, where even people with White House badges aren't allowed to go. Security personnel were alarmed to see high-powered lasers and powerful machine tools right there. But as an old community activist, President Obama loved it. The ostensible, the ostensible message was celebrating the maker movement. But there was a deeper subtext to the photo op. The event was highlighting that the new jobs are unlikely to return to the old factories. Just as personal computers were viewed as toys by the mini computer industry before being destroyed by them, Personal fabrication is likely to disrupt impersonal fabrication. In 2015, Fab 11, the next meeting in the annual gathering of Fab Labs, brought participants from 78 countries to MIT's campus. At that event, leaders from Boston, Somerville, and Cambridge joined Barcelona's commitment. They didn't each get their own countdown clock, but they're all on the same countdown that Barcelona started. Many other cities have since joined them in what's come to be called the Fab City Pledge, now run by Tomas Diaz. Smart cities, namely cities in which everything is instrumented and connected to be responsive in real time, have been a popular trend in urban planning. A Fab City is the next natural next step, crossing from digital to physical and able to sustainably produce and recycle what it consumes. 
this shift will not be a step change. Instead, it's a continuous transition, or more properly, an evolution by punctuated equilibria as new capabilities are introduced. Early steps include producing things like metropolitan wireless data and sensor networks and furniture for civic spaces. Like Fab Labs, no one city has the skills to do all of this. They're being developed jointly by the participating cities, starting with quantifying all the poorly measured inputs and outputs to a city to track its progress. The Fab City City commitment is now inspiring commitments from countries. In 2014, when I was on a trip to Bhutan to plan a Fab Lab there, the opportunity was made concrete in a conversation I had with the thoughtful Prime Minister Sharing Togbe about rice cookers. Bhutan is known for basing its economy around gross national happiness rather than gross national product. This doesn't mean that everyone is happy, but it means that the Bhutanese are very serious about measuring the quality of how people live rather than how much they buy. This concern, unfortunately, doesn't extend to where things come from, which generally means trucks coming over the border border from India. Rice cookers are central to the life of a household in Bhutan and are typically imported from Japan. Making the container for a rice cooker and adding a temperature sensor, a heating element, and a control system is an easy fab lab project. Along with eliminating the import of finished rice cookers, local fabrication allows each cooker to be customized to the size of the family and the design of the kitchen. I had a similar conversation with Rwanda's Minister of Trade and Industry, Francois Kanimba, in 2016 when I was deploying a fab lab there. He was one of the main architects of the economic reforms that allowed Rwanda to become one of the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa. When we spoke, his greatest concern was Rwanda's large and growing trade deficit. The Rwandans were trying to tackle this with import substitution, which generally meant enticing multinationals to open factories in the country rather than import from factories outside the country. Distributing the means of production rather than finished products had not occurred to them until the opening of the first fab lab in Kigali. Just as Africa largely skipped landline telephones and went right to mobile, it can skip the historical stages of the Industrial Revolution and go directly to distributed production. Fab 12, the gathering of the Fab Lab Network in 2016, was hosted by the city of Shenzhen. This is the heart of China's mass manufacturing ecosystem, the engine for the loss of jobs in so many other places. We were there, paradoxically, because China is embracing Fab Labs and the maker movement, and these movements are embracing Shenzhen. The Hikongbei district of Shenzhen is one of my favorite places on earth. It contains a massive market where you can buy a single where you can buy single electronics components at one of the many small counters or a bag of components or a box from a closet down the hall or a truckload from the warehouse down the road or a container from the factory a few towns over. The market features what are called Shenzhai products which I think of as the technological equivalent of rapid eye movement sleep, or REM. In the same way that your dreams mix apparently unrelated experiences into fantastical sequences, these products are technologically mashups. The equivalent of sleep for their manufacturers is what they produce around large export orders. On my last trip to China, I bought what looks like an Apple Watch with two differences— One is that it costs $25 instead of $250, and the second is that it has a slot for the SIM card that Apple forgot to include. The watch is not peripheral to a phone, it is the phone. What looks like an intellectual property theft to the rest of the world is locally viewed as a flourishing open-source engineering community. Like classical composers, the producers shamelessly borrow themes and variations from one another. If in the future Barcelona or Bhutan are going to produce what it consumes, their populations will no longer need Shenzhen to do it for them. The leadership in Shenzhen can see that the era of mass-producing goods, in which they have been so successful, is drawing to a close. However, for many years hence, the building blocks for this vision will be difficult to produce locally. These items aren't the finished products or even the machines that make them. They are the components of those machines. Shenzhen is making a giant pivot to mass-produce things like the motors with integrated lead screws for driving machines that Nadia and Jonathan used, or embedded radios for connecting devices to wireless networks with built-in internet protocols. 
because these elements require significant capital investments to produce, have economies of scale, and don't require customization, it makes sense to manufacture them in volume. In doing this, Shenzhen has been agile in merging multiple functions into a single item to simplify the subsequent engineering effort. There is a parallel to what happened to the computer industry after the arrival of personal computing when the whole mini-computer industry disappeared. The commercial parallel to mini-computers for the third digital revolution is mid-sized manufacturers. But mainframes have become more important than ever in the guise of the giant data centers that host cloud computing. The front end of computing for most people is smartphones, tablets, or PCs, but they rely on a back end in the cloud. Fab labs don't replace ma mass manufacturing, they extend it. Think about what's happened to software or music. At one time, software was written by giants like Microsoft and IBM. Then came open source software in the possibility that anyone could contribute. Today, we have platforms where an app can be written and distributed for one person, 10 people, a hundred, a thousand, or a million. The large proprietary software packages still exist but have arguably become the least interesting part of software development because they have to target common denominators. What has opened up are tiers of software markets that were not previously viable. Likewise, music used to be sold by the record labels. Then came file sharing and a brief spike during which no one paid anyone for anything. Today, there are platforms for buying and selling music tracks with, again, markets of one, 10, 100, 1,000, or a million buyers. In the first case, a string of data becomes a program. In the second case, a string of data becomes a sound. Now, a string of data can become a thing. Mass manufacturing will continue to make products whenever people's needs are identical, and between mass production and do-it-yourself lies a whole hierarchy of new scales of manufacturing that are opening up and that were previously not commercially viable. In the first two digital revolutions, there was a hope that a long tail of smaller content creators would power and be empowered by a new economy. Exactly the opposite has happened. The bulk of the money has been made by a small number of what have become giant companies that own the platforms, companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. Several groups have attempted to carve out a similar share in the third digital revolution, cornering the market for sharing free and paid designs of things to make. Some of these efforts are popular, but none have remotely reached the scale of the music and app sites. Perhaps the effort is just premature. A fab lab today needs all its capabilities to make a range of finished products. There are only so many small useful pieces of plastic that need to be made on an entry-level printer. 3D printer, that is. But another reason may be that making things is more like cooking than choosing entertainment. Although there are sites to share recipes, the commercial activity of cooking is centered around selling groceries and appliances. Look at what happened with 2D printers. MIT spun off the Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, which spawned the, micro the mini computer industry. Then DEC failed and was bought by Compaq, which failed and was bought by HP. One reason HP survived was the economics of inkjet printing. HP's inkjet division in a is in Corvallis, Oregon, because the printer people had to hide from their management in Palo Alto, California. A group of engineers thought that they could make an inexpensive printer that would produce beautiful pages, but it would be slow. At the same time, the printer division had a hierarchy of how many pages per second a printer could produce. The feedback from management was that a slow printer was a terrible idea. So, the engineers moved to Corvallis, where the lowly calculator division was, and used this location as a cover to develop inkjet printers. The point now, of course, is that you don't need a high-volume printer on your desk, because every page you print there is different. There might then be a laser printer down the hall for a work group, a line printer in the basement for an organization, and a roll-to-roll -roll printer in a warehouse for a city. But all the little inkjet printers producing a page at a time add up to the output of the giant roll-to-roll -roll printer. Neither is better. What matters is how much what's being produced varies. This hierarchy in the migration of publishing onto the desktop is analogous to the coming migration of fabrication. 
the scaling of capacity can go in both directions. In 2016, the White House hosted a follow-up event to the maker-to-manufacturing transition on how to go from prototype to a product. At that event, my student Nadia Peek dared the assembled group to think about exactly the opposite direction from manufacturing to maker. The technology emerging for the transition in fab labs from rapid prototyping to the rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines is a kind of automation, but rapid automation that can change to reflect needs rather than represent a large fixed capital investment. Fears that automation will displace workers have assumed a rigid separa separation between us, the workers, and them, the robot owners. But the lesson of the third digital revolution is that them is us. Ownership of manufacturing can become as widely distributed as ownership of computing did. The most important kind of scaling for economic impact is not production capacity, but ideas. A 2015 report adding up to the output adding up the output of businesses spun off from MIT, found that it was a $1.9 trillion venture in annual revenue, which fell somewhere between the output of Russia, the world's ninth largest economy, and India, the tenth. How can a few thousand people at a time match the productivity of a billion? There are two secrets to this. The first is that MIT isn't an isolated technology park trying to make money. It is embedded in an ecosystem in Kendall Square, an environment that mixes long-term research, short-term development, small startups, and large corporations, along with cafes and clubs and parks. Little attention is paid to defining which activity belongs there. And the second is that I think of MIT's core competence as being a safe place for strange people. Many of my colleagues would be considered dysfunctional in polite society. But by definition, to invent, you need to question assumptions, and that's not narrowly confined to a small slice of life. Much of this business creation doesn't start with dreams of riches. One of the drivers is a vision for change in the world, like, say, the need for flying cars. And an even greater driver is finding places to work where you fit. A group of my students who worked on early quantum computing started a company, Thing Magic, to continue working together. The company ended up developing the reference platform for reading radio fre frequency identification, RFID, product tags, at store checkouts. They didn't start with a vision of conquering retail technology, but stumbled across a match between a need and their skills. The opportunity for fab cities, towns, and villages is to do the same on a global, on a global scale. The same secrets that make MIT work in the zip code 02139 are behind the spread of fab labs everywhere else. They're functioning as nodes in an ecosystem, defined not geographically but intellectually, where inventive people who don't fit in rigid school or business hierarchies belong. This kind of social infrastructure might appear to be intangible, but as the example of MIT spinoffs shows, it's even more important than the physical infrastructure. Countless regional economic development projects are spending vast sums to try to become the next Silicon Valley. But in the third digital revolution, the next economic engine is not a place. It is a network of places linked by digital communications, computation, and fabrication. Organization. In 2005, I found myself on a boat with a broken motor, drifting ever closer to a glacier off the coast of Svalbard, the last stop before the North Pole. I was there with Hakan Carlsen, the aforementioned herder who runs the fab lab in Lingen at the top of Norway. We were visiting to look at the needs of and opportunities in this most remote part of the country. The motor was eventually brought back to life, but those hours spent with an approaching glacier looming over us captured how it felt to try to keep up with the ever-increasing requests for access to a fab lab and people's offers to devote themselves to the movement. We realized then that what we needed that we needed to build organizational capacity beyond what my lab or his farm could provide. The problem was a classic commons issue. It wasn't hard to find funding for the fa for the parts of a fab lab that you could see. What was hard to fund was the infrastructure that made these parts possible, the infrastructure that you couldn't see. This included the development of the technology that went into a fab lab, the management of the global supply chain to source everything, maintaining the teams to deploy a lab, and the computing that supported them. All these infrastructure needs initially came out of my research funding, which was not a scalable model. We had tried to partner with philanthropic foundations, but they lacked the technical skills to do, to do this. 
People running investment funds did understand speculative technical risk, but they weren't interested in supporting commons. And research funders didn't support field organizations. As a last result, we concluded that we had to create our own organization. This took five tries to get right. The first four attempts tried to raise funds to, comp to cover these common costs because it was a worthy thing to do. But these attempts didn't go anywhere. Not only were funders uninterested, but the decentralized fab labs didn't embrace the creation of a centralized entity. Instead of trying to sell the benefits of fab labs, the fifth attempt simply sold the services that everyone needed. And that's how the fab foundation was started. There's a common misconception that open source projects are flat organizations. The large successful ones are built around a hierarchy with a benevolent dictator, such as Linus Torvalds with Linux and Mitchell Baker with Mozilla. This strong leadership enables everyone else to contribute. Since people aren't compelled to follow this leadership, the authority comes from the soft power of moting, motivating them to participate rather than through command and control. The most notable example of soft power technological leadership is the Internet Architecture Board, the IAB, which provides technical direction for the Internet. This is a committee of 13 people who no one outside the networking community has heard of. The way they work is apparent in the title of the standards they manage. Request for comment, RFCs. No one need follow these standards, but because of the benefits of being a part of the Internet, almost everyone using a computer does. The IAB is a committee of the Internet Engineering Task Force and an advisory body of the Internet Society. These sprang from the Internet Configuration Control Board, which was created in 1979 to advise what was then still a government research project. These organizations have, have lived on long past their modest origins through the decades of exponential growth of the Internet. The growth of the Fab Lab network is now at the same stage of spawning organizational, organizational scaffolding. The equivalent to RFCs includes a Fab ar Charter articulating the rights and responsibilities of a Fab Lab, the inventory of what goes into a Fab Lab, the curriculum at the Fab Academy, and a listing of where the Fab Labs are at the fablabs.io portal. These elements all, all evolve with input from many people, any one decision may not be best for a particular purpose, but the collective benefit of having these common standards outweighs the cost of being optimal but fragmented. As the organizational capacity of the Fab Lab network has grown, it's being tapped by partner programs that want to work with Fab Labs co collaboratively in a way they can't do individually. In one complementary approach, companies invest in a kind of have your cake and eat it too, corporate social responsibility, supporting fab labs in communities where the companies are, and in doing so, identifying and training promising technical talent. In another approach, fab labs work with aid agencies to set up groups of fab labs in targeted parts of the world. Patrick Colgan ran a European Union body to support post-Troubles reconciliation in Northern Ireland. The group's search for alternative ways to invest in the reconciliation led to the launch of Fab Labs at the Nerve Center in Derry and at the Ashton Center in Belfast. Both these centers are adjacent to the euphemistically named Peace Walls, which are really segregation barriers. Kids now come to work together in the Fab Labs from both sides of the wall, transcending their historical divisions. After seeing the impact that the labs were having, there is now interest in expanding this program to the rest of Ireland, both north and south. Engineering colleges in India can be notorious for divorcing formal study from building hands-on skill. In the state of Kerala, CBA set up fab labs initially in Kochi and Trivandrum. Now Kerala Startup Mission and Kerala Technological University are working with the Fab Foundation to establish the first 20 of a projected 150 Fab Labs based in engineering colleges. To provide the capacity for this, Fab Academy graduates are taking over from the initial MIT students to do the installation and training. The first Fab Lab in Egypt was started in Cairo by Dina El Zanfali and a couple of Egyptian co-founders in 2011 after she took the How to Make Almost Anything class as a graduate student at MIT. During the post-revolution riots in Egypt, she telephoned the lab to make sure that everyone was okay. Her counterparts in the lab laughed and reported that it was one of their busiest days because the bright, inventive youth who had no interest in sectarian conflict had taken the disruption as a day off to go work in the lab. 
Their lab has since worked with the Egyptian Ministry of Education, USAID, and the Fab Foundation on establishing fab labs in STEM high schools across Egypt, as well as with the Orange Foundation and other organizations on community fab labs, including the Mobile Fab Lab on Wheels, FLOW. Last year, the lab organized Maker Fair Cairo, a one-day event that had 10,000 participants from the community. Benno Juarez attended the, the Fab Academy in 2009 and then started Peru's first Fab Lab. This grew out of a collaboration between Barcelona's Fab Lab and Spain's aid ministry. Rather than sending money, Peruvian innovators were identified, trained, and then sent back with a Fab Lab. The lab upended the rigid educational hierarchy in Peru. When his university began to, began to declare how the Fab Lab would be used, Juarez and his colleagues explained that it was theirs, not the school's, and unless it remained an accessible resource, they would move it elsewhere. He had grown up in the Amazon, where, he observes, there were three career choices, farmer, soldier, or terrorist. He chose none of the above and is now leading a project to bring a floating Fab Lab up the Amazon River for sustainable production in indigenous communities. We ran a pop-up fab lab at the United Nations for the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals Initiative, which was the largest gathering of heads of state ever assembled. The goals came out of an inclusive process that followed what were effectively the Rich White Guys Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals included objectives like access to health care, education, clean energy and water, and ending poverty and hunger. The assembled diplomats would look at us funnily, wondering why we were, we were there. Then there would be an epiphany moment as they realized that most of the SDGs required the ability to go from bits to atoms, to locally make healthcare sensors, water filters, and so forth. We've also run pop-up fab labs at the World Economic Forum in Davos to show, rather than tell, the assembled political and business leaders about digital fabrication. At one of these, the then UN Head of Humanitarian Relief encountered the lab, apparently annoyed that it was intruding on important discussions about providing infrastructure, educational opportunity, business incubation, and entertainment in refugee camps. Then you could see the light bulb go off as she realized that access to digital fabrication was a common denominator across all these issues, a commonality that the incumbents were not considering. This observation led to the launch of the Global Humanitarian Lab, run by David Ott, who came from the International Committee of the Red Cross, and Olivier Delarue from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Their organizations are literally on the front lines of the most troubled parts of the planet. Ott and Delarue approached us about the possibility of shipping bits rather than atoms for rapid response, producing whatever is needed on demand locally, from prosthetics to shelters. When they were looking at setting up dedicated labs, they realized that they could do this as an overlay to the whole Fab Lab network in the same way that a range of services are now provided over the internet. They could use the labs as a virtual platform for humanitarian relief. In those kinds of gatherings of global leaders, I find that the politicians are generally rather glum. They're all struggling with, intra with intractable problems of unemployment, inequality, and immigration, along with the knock-on consequences of polarization and conflict. And the levers they've historically used to deal with these issues, adjusting things like monetary policy, aren't working. On the other hand, the gatherings of the kinds of local leaders, who as I've described are leading the third digital revolution on the ground, are generally rather cheerful. They are having a real impact in their communities, and there's lots of room for future growth, and on top of it all, they're having fun. With this divergence between top-down and bottom-up realities, there's a real sense that the leaders of the future aren't coming up through the organizations of the past. The current technology in a fab lab is intended to make itself obsolete, as we'll talk about in Chapter 5. Like the invention of the internet on many computers, what's going to live on is not the current embodiment, but the ecosystem that's evolving around the inventions. For the first thousand fab labs, it was interesting just to count their numbers, like following the appearance of the first websites. What matters now is not that they exist, but why. If anyone can make anything anywhere, how will we live, learn, work, and play? Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.